All right. Hello, LinkedIn and YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us live today. We're going to talk about Bush Analytics. Basically, we're going to touch on insights from the Safari industry. So I want to make sure that things are working now. I actually tried to um, start the session about five minutes ago because we like to be on time, but uh, we had a small technical error. Okay. It looks like everything is working very well right now. Before I bring on uh, the, the guests that we're going to have on the show today, we're going to have Tom I'm Tom Imery, who's a consultant with Pomerol Partners, and Nicole Kanz, co-founder at Step One Hospitality and Tourism Consulting. I want to ask those who are joining us live right now, what is your favorite safari animal? I will start. My favorite safari animal is actually an elephant. We, um, we chatted briefly with Tom and Nicole before the session started, and they talked about having monkeys in their backyards, which I think is adorable. I told them I'd adopt them, but they said uh, it's probably not going to happen. So if you're joining us now, just let me know what is your favorite safari animal. And I'm going to go ahead and bring our guests into the stream. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Tom. Hey. Hi, how, how are, are you? Great, great. How are you doing? Good, good. So good, excited about- to be here. Yeah, it's about 6 p.m. there, right? For, for both of you, are you in the same time zone? No, I, I'm, uh, I'm for us at 6. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's just gone 5 here. So I, 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 you can probably see just behind me that the, uh, the the shadows are creeping down. So we're in the last throes of autumn here. Um, but um, yeah, so just after 5. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Why don't you let people know where you're tuning in from and... Um, just just to let people know that they're 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 tuning in from a remote location and we might or may not have technical difficulties with Wi-Fi. We probably won't. It's been good so far. But go ahead, let, let us know where you're tuning in from. Cool. Well, hey everyone. Um I'm tuning in from the very northeastern corner of South Africa. So I I don't know how many of you are familiar with South Africa, but I'm very close to where Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and South Africa meet. Um, it's a famous part of South Africa for safari and for wildlife. Um, yeah, thousands and thousands of hectares of wild animals roaming free. Um, so um, when Kate was talking about remote locations, we, we, we do tend to have connection problems sometimes, which <laughs> drives us absolutely batty. Um, but um, yeah, so beautiful, beautiful part of the country. Um, I've, I've been in this part of the world probably for about the last 16, 17 years now um, with a little break. I, I, my former life was um, in the big city, and as an adult, I spent a lot of time teaching golf and had an inglorious career as a golf professional. Um, managed to to get into the wilderness about uh, in about 2004, and uh, guided for about 12 years. Managed to settle down, get married, um, had two beautiful little children, and um, as they started to grow out of their um, schooling needs or they needed to, to get closer to, to schools, um, we improbably took them on an adventure around the world for 18 months for two years and went backpacking around Thailand and road tripping around Europe, um, which was lots of fun. Um, but the, the call of the wild um, brought us back here to this part of South Africa. Um, so pretty much that's that's my background and that's what I'm doing here. Yeah. All right. And Nicole, where are you tuning in from? Uh, Hi, I'm calling you from the beautiful island of Zanzibar, which is just off the coast of Tanzania mainland in East Africa. I'm originally from Austria. Uh, I moved to Zanzibar and Tanzania about nine years ago. Um, First started off in Zanzibar, then moved uh, to Arusha, which is the center of the the, the safari hub of, uh, of Tanzania and spent a lot of time there working for the safari and uh, hotel industry. And last year, I decided to move back to Zanzibar, um, set up um, a company with, uh, with friends and, and, and uh, yeah, and have been happy here, uh, currently um, at the beach and, uh, and looking forward for the session. Um, yeah, we, we do have challenges sometimes with generators coming and going, uh, power coming and going. So just in case I disappear, uh, I will just have to switch my Wi-Fi and I'll get back on. Well, it seems like a small price to pay for the beautiful wildlife that you're surrounded by. And it you're is, at the beach. That's terrible. Great. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some uh, responses here from the audience for their favorite animals. So Michael said rhino. We've got Hamish is here. Uh, he's got meerkat. 
We got Greg with the giraffe. Oh, yeah, giraffes are great, too. We got lions, lions, tigers. It's going to be a fun session. Um, <laughs> lions, hands down, zebras, hippos, ground squirrel. Um, how about you guys? What are your favorite safari animals? Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> Really, uh, you go first, Tom. <laughs> I, I I did so many animals. I actually fell in love with trees, believe it or not. And um, <laughs> but if I if I had to if I had to pick a, an animal, it would be um, a bush baby, which is a, a, a very oh, small kind of primate one. that we get in the early evenings. Yeah, um, they're intoxicating to watch. Lots and lots of fun. Yeah, um, I think I'll go for for hippos. Yeah, I, I I think they're just, um, they look like ladies with way too much makeup on. I, I just think they're, I mean, they're super dangerous, but uh, they look like any, could, cartoons don't do them just when you actually see them. I You know, you sort of wait for the elephants and everything else, but I was surprised how much I love the hippos. Yeah. Are they are they as mean as we're told they are, or as yeah, scary? Yeah, I think they're really yeah they're very scary, very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for sharing that. Um, you know, before we get into talking about the safari industry and analytics and the trends, let's hear a little bit about your companies and what you do. So, Tom, if you want to, you know, start with Parmo Partners and let everybody know what you're doing there. Sure, and, it, and it's great to see that um, a couple of the guys from Pomerol have joined on the call, so thanks very much for that. Um, Pomerol is a, um, and I'm getting messages on Skype as well, um, so Pomerol is a, a, a global company that does um, uh, data analytics and business intelligence. Um, there are about 50 of us scattered across the globe. Um, we're headquartered in um, London, um, but we've got a strong presence in the States, particularly in the Midwest. Um, most of our analytics are um, for top tier banks, big pharma, manufacturing companies, telcos, airports. Um, there's a wide variety um, of, of stuff that we do um, and, and pretty much the, there's, there's not much that we don't do. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, very, it's a very dynamic company. Um, I was blessed on my, my, my travels um, abroad to spend a bit of time in London and learn from some of the guys in the London office. Um, that's where my sort of BI career started. And some of the products that we're going to talk about tonight, um, were actually, I, I developed while we were traveling through the Balkans um, and sitting on beaches in Greece and places like that. But um, but that's but that's the global company. Um, in South Africa, we have a, a little niche, which is focused very much on the safari and tourism industry. Um, it, it's something that's very close to my heart. And um, having left it and well, having been in it for 12 years and then having left it, it's been absolutely brilliant to be able to combine my, my passion for wildlife and, and tourism around wildlife with um, with analytics. Um, it's a really, really good fit. Um, and it, it keeps me eternally smiling. Um, but yeah, so so that's uh, Pomerol. That's great. Thank you. And Nicole, um, do you want to give an intro of Step on Hospitality and sure. Tourism? Sure. So, so yeah, um, I, I I was working in the hotel industry for the last um, ten years, specifically for for a combination of bush and uh, beach properties, and um, I am very much specialized in digital distributions and um, and uh, and combining um, uh, technology with the users and 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 uh, and and applying them and Im implementing them for reservations departments and um, one of the great companies that I came across was was uh, Pomerol uh, so while uh, Tom was uh, backpacking across Europe we were developing projects together and solutions for for clients together so that's kind of that started off and then as I as I moved into my my own consultancy we decided to to reach out to companies and and offer that knowledge to other companies. First of all, um, usually um, large companies and, and multi-property companies enjoy technology and implementation of technology, but also smaller companies can use a solution and technical solutions to 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 compensate for the missing staff. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the that's where we wanted to reach out. So first of all, solutions for smaller companies and hotels, but also provide um, consultancy for larger companies when it comes to business structure. So what we do is we go in, we look at your problem, we use data analysis and Pomerol to, to look at the data at the back end, mm -hmm. and then um, come up with strategies and use, again, 
technology from Pond Merle to to monitor targets. So that's basically um, some setup. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you. So, how did um, you and Tom meet? Like, how do you how do you work together then? So, so actually, um, the, the the company that I was a I was the guide at um, Pomerol was doing some um, some BI for them. Um, this was, uh, um, I, I guess, around sort of 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, kind of stop start sort of um, very simple sort of dashboard analytics. Um, that may be a bit later, 2013, 2014. Um, and then when I when I climbed on board, it was the natural place for me to start to. Um, you know, to get the software up and running and to to fine tune the product, um, and so I, I I had done that. Basically, I'd completed what I thought was a thrilling dashboard with loads of really compelling insights. I, I thought I'd absolutely hit the mark, and I, I got hold of the um, the reservation system that it was on the back of, and that was a, a company called ResRequest. And glad to see that they've joined us tonight. Um, and they're they're just a wonderful company to work with, and they opened their doors and. We created this sort of um, real head of steam to get these analytics pushed out um, as far and as wide as we could around Africa. And the first person they introduced me to was Nicole. And um, so I'll, I'll freely admit I was terrified for the first couple of weeks, but um, Nicole really kind of opened opened the door to this magical world of, of data and of insights. I mean, she had really, um, her, her depth of knowledge um, and her, her prom, profound insights around around the data and the way that it's used, um, and and some of the reports that she had manually and and handcrafted um, over over many years, um, were stuff that we were able to in, incorporate into this beautiful little package that we called Res Insight. Um, so that that was the beginning from being absolutely terrified and then um, taking a lot of guidance. We we worked quite hard together and, and managed to put together this, this really compelling sort of um, package of. Um, data analytics and insights um, that we've been um, really freely pushing around to as many people as we can around the African continent. So, so, so that was the start, and I think um, it's a, it, it's a it's a real budding relationship. So we're um, we're, we're hoping to become a, a really big sort of tour de force across Africa, where um, we use Nicole's sort of insights and, and knowledge and turn around strategies um, and Pomerol's ability to to fetch any kind of data to crack it open and, 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 and to look at it sort of from a holistic sort of point of view. Perfect. Seems, yes. like, seems like a, a match made in heaven. Perfect relationship. Yes. No, absolutely. So so just just to, to to add on to that, what I had been doing was uh, creating models on Excel and and spending weeks in, in creating data and basically uh, Tom gave 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 me the opportunity to put everything into in, into software together with Pomerol. So we actually what was done manually and you know and, and strategically go years and years of of documents suddenly had a had a place to live in an app. So that was so it was it was great. Yeah, good. It was good stuff. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's get into it. Bush Analytics. I'm sure that brings interesting thoughts to people's minds based on where their mind's at. What is Bush Analytics? <laughs> who, can, who wants to describe well, I, So Bush Analytics is cool. I, it's not, I mean, the, the amusing thing here is it, it's not like an official name that we have. I mean, it's not, um, there, there, there's no logo, at, you know, in Zanzibar or anywhere that says Bush Analytics. And, and it is a nice romantic name. And I, I mean, it conjures up sort of strawberry daiquiris and gin and tonics and, Elephants and herds of migrating wildebeest, but it's um, it's uh, basically it, it, it's a name that broadly sort of fits tourism. I think in Africa, um, mm -hmm. it's it's um, it, it, it is it is kind of catchy, um, but but to be honest, it's it's not just bush. It's also beach and it's also city, mm -hmm. um, and um, just sticking with the with the hospitality side at the moment. Um, pretty much, if if you've got a, a bed in Africa and you've got a um, well, if you've got a, if you've got a bed in Africa um, and you've got data that's floating around it, um, that's that that falls into our, our sort of area of comfort. We 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 would love to help um, extract the data around that and to manipulate it and model it um, to give you better insights. But it's it's yeah, pretty much anything in Africa. Okay, so bush, beach, and city. Um, so maybe yeah. you guys can talk a little bit about the. You know the, the types of clients you serve and the locations that you're focused on for the for the business. I think I think the most important part to remember is the way business is done or comes into Africa at this point, or at least East Africa and Southern with the safari business. Um, mm -hmm. 
So uh, unlike maybe an, an, um, a model you would think um, as common in, in, the, in, in the States or in, in Europe where you have a city hotel, you book straight away or you have maybe a travel agent who books for you. Uh, business here is done a little different. There's a lot of people involved in the sales of a bed night, yeah, of a of a bed. So you will have a, an agent in the U.S. putting a package uh, a package together uh, for an itinerary. He will then order that with the tour operator, which is the person who owns the car. The car, the person who owns the car is in control of the itinerary. Hmm. So he then buys the rooms from uh for his itinerary yeah from the hotels yeah so that changes that that leaves a hotel and property owners very far at the far end um of the process so mm -hmm. what we try to do is is in what in some of the analytics that we work with we try to um find out you know where the client's coming from who's booking me who's booking me more frequently on a on the middle agent but then also overseas which countries where did my market because the the hotels here will also market in the US mm -hmm. but their aim is to get the agent to book them or the client to ask for a certain property so there's a very complex um, relationship and and Pomerol and then the analytics that we've created gives us the on one side the marketing um, uh, data to to follow through and to see if our investments have reached the right market. Uh, you know, I went to a trade show in the US. Um, how many clients actually came to the US? Because here on our books, it will be only the local agent who booked me. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. the it's the shop down the road who booked me, but I wouldn't know unless I I, I sort of use the data and the data mining that we're able to do with with the Pond Moral system um, to to get there. Yeah, so that's one part. Uh, Tom, would you? Agree? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it, it's a really, really congested supply chain. Um, loads of people all clamoring for commission. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, some of the reservation systems out there aren't necessarily designed to, um, to, to cope with the length of the supply chain. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to work with one that, one that does. Um, but we're, wherever possible, our, our job is really to take that data, um, to segment it, um, and, and to really help um, you know the guys who make the marketing decisions. Um, you know, really get get to the crux of where is their business coming from. Um, and you know, sometimes it's not always about where is it coming from. It's it's where where it's not coming from. You know, where uh, you know Nicole and, Nicole and I both spend a lot of time looking for holes in revenue and and potholes and occupancies. And you know, we want to we want to try and find those holes um, before anybody else can. And and by 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 knowing the length of the supply chain and where everybody fits in, give them the tool to, to kind of to kind of fill those. Um, I, I think you also asked where we sort of operate. Um, mm -hmm. So N N Nicole, is, um, she has a lot of expertise in the sort of East African region, and um, I've, I've been mostly playing around in the the, the garden that is South Africa. Um, but um, I, I think at the moment, Nicole, we're, we're about eleven different countries, um, approaching about sort of two hundred different camps on the on the the one platform that we have. Um, and um, and and step one and Pomerol are really just getting started. So, um, you know, there are a lot of new countries coming on board, um, like Rwanda and Burundi. Um, we've we've got clients in Madagascar, top of Kenya, bottom of South Africa, Namibia, Zambia. Um, but um, yeah, any basically, we'd like to cover the whole of Africa and be maybe the most trusted source of analytics in the industry. Okay, Lucky ambitions. Awesome. But all right, so this is, um, I'm learning a lot. Okay, so one of my personal life dreams is to wash a baby elephant. I don't care how crazy people think I am. Um, if I, where, how would I be booking, let, let's say I would like to go at least see an elephant in Africa. And I'm in New York, right? So who would I be booking this with and how would that data flow look on the back end? I'm not sure um, the question is targeted to just anybody. Well, no, no. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to. I was going to say you're, you're the perfect because you've you've designed and implemented these strategies. So, yeah. please, yeah. Uh, um, well, it sort of depends. You know, it, it depends if you're already a client of ours or not. Number one, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> because we will probably tell you. Yeah. So very important is to see. Um, of, of course, we have. We even have Booking.com and and Expedia and the normal um, uh, mm -hmm. two operating the, those uh, platforms working here. The problem there is that you're booking the room on your own. 
um, they do not include the cause. So we very often have the problem that somebody, you know, swipes a credit card, um, had enough, decides to book um, all-inclusive holiday um, in in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Uganda, in South Africa, but ends up at the ho- uh, you know uh, ends up at the airport and suddenly realizes that uh, you know we're in the middle of the bush uh, or you're you know uh, the flights and you know you cannot enter the national parks after midnight, so we mm-hmm. actually have to go and rescue them. So there's a there's a supply chain um, here that that needs that means that the um, most important um, player in the game is actually the two operating companies. Yeah. So what we're seeing more and more is companies actually creating APIs, connection between different, between the itinerary building softwares mm-hmm. and, the, and, the, and the accommodation holding softwares. Yeah. So those are usually two different companies. Some of them, sometimes they're combined, but mo- at the moment, most likely. And slowly we're seeing that uh, changing, that people are changing to software that can actually um, connect and communicate with, with, with two operating software. The problem mm-hmm. is that um, the Ferraris that are out there in the, in the system, something like Opera or these all these big solutions, are all not used to or do not really cater to interaction. Yeah. So, so, so we actually have to rely on local Safari tailored software um, that can do that and communicate that. So if you if you ask me, um, um, you can book, book properly book the room. You can properly book the car and another platform, but the combination is currently not possible. You would have to go to an agent, and if you if you use a, an agent who who is set up correctly um, in our uh, in, in the way we would like to see it, he can actually book live. Um, from the hotel, combine it with his car, and off they go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom, did I did I miss anything? No, no, not at all. And, and that's all good. And and you know, because I know when when Kate says she wants to see a baby elephant, I mean, I want you know, to if you want, want to see, I'd like yeah. to watch it, Tom. But but if you were if you were desperate to see the Trevi Fountain, um, there, there's a chance that you would book yourself a um, a, a self service. Um, sort of holiday in Rome. I mean, you, you'd book your own flights and probably find your own hotel. Here, yeah. yeah. So, so one of the real challenges about the um, the, the safari industry in Africa is is that, um, well, there's many challenges. But but one, for example, is that often the headlines are taken out of context. So, um, you know, the Ebola pandemic uh, or or a um, some terrorism in, in Somalia or some headlines about pirates or a malaria outbreak, cholera, all of these kind of things. Um, it, 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 it seems to be quite an intimidating place to go. And, and having experiences, if, if you're sitting in New York, chances are you're not gonna, you're not gonna create your own self-service holiday. You're gonna find somebody on the internet um, who will um, strike you as being, um, you know, they've been around for a long time, they've got lots of trust, they've got lots of clients sort of testimonials. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, that's how, and that's how you would get there. Um, I, I guess what's exciting for us is that, um, you know, with all of that sort of activity with, uh, you know, the, the person you found sort of, you know, on on, on Fourth Avenue who, who said, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And then they got hold of, you know, somebody in Kenya who specializes in that area. And then suddenly there's you, the client, um, and there's, there's there's two links and there's a hotel. And, and that, that's four pieces of data that need to be stitched together. Um, mm-hmm. And if they're not done correctly, then um, then then holes start to appear and, and everything falls apart. So... Um, anyway, that was a very long answer that I just gave you to how we give up to the, um, I, I think. <laughs> the, the problem is it's, it's a long process, a lot of different uh, elements. And that's also where I, I know, you know, we've talked about data quality yeah. and data assurance. That's why it's so important. Uh, and that's why it's a complex tool that has to be created to, to track the information through the different systems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And back to the user. So, so, so that's, that simple question has a very long answer in Africa. Absolutely, I can imagine. We actually have a, a really interesting question here from Pranita. Uh, she says, how has the current COVID-19 scenario affected the industry and what analytics insights do you expect to have during this time? That is a really good question. And, and that's, <laughs> gonna have a, that's gonna have a long answer. Um, Pranita, yeah, thanks very much for that question. Um, I, I can probably speak on, on on sort of behalf on what's happening in South Africa, but our, our tourism industry is, is effectively closed. Um, as, as South Africans, we can't even move between provinces, um, and certainly we're not allowed um, any international travellers 
um, and you can only leave South Africa if you're being repatriated. So, um, look, COVID-19 has, has had a devastating impact on the industry here. Um, um, some of the, the, the less or some of the more pessimistic folk think we're not going to see any international travel until 2021. Um, and, and obviously, you know, we'll see how things go, but, but it, it's had a massive effect. Um, I, I don't think everybody's going to get through this crisis unscathed. I, I expect some, some places will, um, will fold, which will obviously be devastating. Because uh, I think I was reading that, you know, about one in every 20 jobs in South Africa um, caters for tourism. So, yeah. um, you know, we're a, it, it, it's a really big sort of chunk of our economy. Um, so, that, so that's it. I, I, I can speak freely that um, mo most of our clients, their doors are shut. And we, um, you know, and in terms of the analytical insights we're giving at the moment, we, we've had to move quite quickly um, in, in a couple of ways. The, the, the first is, is that when this comes and a, and a whole bunch of people can't travel, well, you know, the question is, what do you do with the bookings? And um, the African tourism industry has moved very quickly to try and get travelers to postpone their bookings rather than to cancel them outright. And and they've done and they've done really well. So a whole bunch of bookings for 2020, in many cases, have just been shifted to 2021. And and the guys who've booked those safaris are you know are looking forward to seeing that elephant baby elephant next year. You know rather rather than this August, they'll do it next August. Um, but in in a, in a system that that can be quite complex. I mean it, yeah. it's um you know depending on on how you've moved the bookings. You know have they have they cancelled them? Have they postponed them? Have they waitlisted them? And it, you know if you don't if you don't have a um, a very good sort of standard operating procedure when it comes to that, you can very quickly, you know, create this unruly mess, um, which is what Nicole and I have been trying to sort out um, in many cases. So, so that we've had to do. We, we, we've had to get into the analytics and we've had to, um, you know, show a lot of people that, look, um, this is the way you're currently handling your bookings that are postponing. Um, and, it, and it's different. It's different here and it's different there and it's different over there. So, so come up with a unified approach. Then, because of this knock-on effect, I mean, it, it's it's great that they are holding or, or or saving a lot of these bookings, but it it has a massive impact on their ability to earn revenue next year. Um, if if all of their August 2020 business has moved to 2021 business, then you know there's not much space for for new business in 2021. So so we're really looking into the analytics and carving it up and 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 trying to show people that you know this is where you've moved your business so this is the roll on effect that you're having on your ability to earn income next year and and that's critical because it helps them make decisions about when they you know where they move certain bookings um what mm -hmm. specials they create and, and and how they operate around that um i think some of the other thing from an analytics point of view um this has had a big in financial impact on a lot of um clients and customers um a lot of them are, are holding deposits or in some cases have been fully paid for bookings that are not arriving um, and they've needed to move quite quickly to work out what their exposure from a financial point of view was. Um, so we've helped with a few models that have really um, let people um, work out what their exposure is um, and, and play around with different options. I think, did I cover most of that, Nicole? Yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. We in Tanzania yeah. have a little, uh, our scenario here's a bit different. Um, we are open for business uh, mm. as of June. Um, the the so we're expecting so from from a Tanzanian point of view um, the government has says we allowed international international travel to arrive um, we are waiting for the first of June to arrive and see if people actually travel yeah uh, and and are hopeful that that will happen um, obviously so this is so we've got some clients who are trying to get ready to see you know what are the charts like. Um, you know uh, what what cleanup work had to be done just before we open up again because basically what happened in 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 end of march end of april everybody sort of dropped um <laughs> what was going on and went and sent uh people home yeah so there's we're sort of picking up and seeing seeing what's what's going on so those are the ones who are planning to open yeah there are those who have decided not to open um, because they say that you know even if clients come in uh, or guests come in, we expect that it's not uh, reaching 20%. The larger inventory hotels say that we won't open this year, we won't open till December uh, mm -hmm. because uh, it just doesn't cover cover costs. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of um, you know debate going on. I think there's a really in Tanzania or East Africa, in Tanzania for instance, there's a whole lot of waiting for the next couple of weeks to see how it develops. Um, Uganda is total shut down. They haven't opened the the airports. Uh, Kenya also. So you know it's it's 
you know, and, and the problem is with long haul destinations um, that even if the air, you know, if Europe uh, is opening their airspace and they've decided to travel, it doesn't mean that they're opening long, uh, long haul destinations. Plus, when guests return back home, they would need to go in a quarantine unless mm -hmm. they've changed that. So there's a whole lot of dynamics going on at the moment before we can actually say just because you as a country decided to um, to accept guests that we're actually going to see guests. So that's Bush, especially. I think that we might see a different scenario at the, you know, in places like Zanzibar, that maybe people would rather, you know, not travel on the safari, but are ready to go to the beach. There's a lot of vacation, local travel, people moving to the beach, uh, guilty. Um, uh, you know, the, these kind of things happening, yeah. So so we'll see how it develops. We're hopeful, yeah. Uh, and we're obviously helping people that. Tom, um, just I don't know. I know that you prepared something. Do you want to show your screen on on how we can help people with analytics um, with the with the recovery? Um, yeah, cool. I'm actually just um, I can actually. I think. Let me see if this is up. I need to share my screen. Kate. Yeah, yeah we'll have to Kate, we'll share because of our first incidents. Ah, yes. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was all transparent. <laughs> We had to restart. So, yeah, Tom, if you can share again, and we've got some interesting questions coming in, but let's do your screen share first. There you go. Perfect. Um, so, uh, look, obviously, this is this is a big program, and it's um, it, it's beautifully all based on um, anomalous data. So, it's pretty much what we demo to um, all new new clients that are coming in. Um, it's demo data, so nobody should take anything they see on the screen. Um, Seriously, but uh, th this was just a quick idea that one of the first things we did um, when these lockdowns started happening is we we, we started monitoring for everybody. Um, this is a reservation count and we're um, working in different weeks here. So this was from the start of the year, the number of reservations that people were receiving on a weekly basis. And then you can see sort of around about the middle of February when the news started breaking, it just an, an absolute crash. Um, right. And now I started to see a bit of a pickup, and that's and we, we track these things across uh, reservations. We, we we track it across revenue. We track it across room nights. Um, and year to date, most important, yeah, year to date, we can also show you uh, like what was it the same time last year, or mm -hmm. the, the same time the year before. So depending on how many systems, uh, how many how your data was loaded, you can you can compare it to the years before. Yeah, so so we've got these, um, you know, we we've got this really great ability to drill down into um, any any particular dates we need on this particular demo at the moment. We're working on financial years, but but we do. At, what we try and do is we, we try and provide a lot of year to date analytics this year versus last year, first quarter versus oh, second quarter versus first quarter. Um, one of the really interesting things that's going to happen is that, um, you know, when we look at historic data, twenty twenty is going to be this. Um, vast sort of black hole and um so we're going to have to um we're probably going to have to look at other years to to fill what happened in 2020 so um if you want to compare your 2021 or 2022 performance versus a year 2020 probably won't be the right one to look at um it would be it would be something like um 20 a, a combination of sort of 2019 2018 mm -hmm. which is a pity because 2020 was shaping up to be an absolute blockbuster across africa I, I can't, there wasn't a single person I hadn't spoken to who thought this was going to be the most exciting year in the industry. No. Um, but, but we're but we're resilient. We'll get we'll get back there. Um, Nicole, was that kind of what you wanted yeah, to start? I was just sort of saying yeah, yeah today. Yeah. 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 yeah I just think wanted that, to show off your toy. <laughs> yeah. Show off your yeah. That, there's a there's a lot of toys. When when um <laughs> this is a this is a much condensed version. I think this is three point one. That we're running at the moment and at one point it had uh i think 22 tabs and about 200 charts and visualizations and um we've we've managed Every to make it idea um, we ever had yes <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it all went in but it but it, it's all it's all been condensed and it, it it's a lot more sort of concise um and, and a lot more user friendly um but we're on 3.1 we're already looking at designing 3.2 um, mm -hmm. And I, th I think, Nicole, the, the one thing we, we just, uh, because of that great question that was asked about, um, um, you know, how we're sort of helping with analytics, we, we've also, um, Nicole and I have, um, you know, we've 
we, we try to get creative. So, so th there are a few th things that are in the pipeline. I, I think one of those is we're trying to create, and if you don't, if you don't mind me talking about it, Nicole, we're, we're trying to create a um, a place for um, every, everybody, all the stakeholders in African tourism, to go to where where they can get all of the news feeds that are most important to them. So in, instead of having to root around and Google for hours and hours and hours and surfing the web um, to find out what's happening, we, we want to create a lot of news feeds um, that are particularly relevant. Um, we're, we're also trying to, because uh, we know that Tanzania, like Nicole has mentioned, is opening in June. Um, there, there are a lot of real pertinent questions around that. It's like, okay, that's great, Tanzania is open, but you know who can get there and, and how? Um, you know, we know that um, you know you might be able to fly there from the UK, but you're going to be sort of quarantined. So, yeah. so there's a lot of information that we can aggregate and publish about when when different flight routes are opening up um, across the continent. So, um, yeah, so th so that stakeholders um, can go to one trusted source to to work all of this stuff out. Yeah, yeah I think I think yeah. So sorry, uh, but uh, yeah. So what what we what we sort of what we're brainstorming about is creating this like this dashboard for anybody in the hotel or in the, in the hospitality tourism industry, no matter if it's a DMO or a DC, uh, you know, a, tour, a, a tourism board, um, anyone to just have that one screen in the morning to see um, is recovery back. Yeah, we said like, so you have one resource where you sort of go and see, okay, who's changed the travel plan. The, the information at the moment is so dynamic, yeah. Um, and I have, you know, people, clients calling, asking about forecasts. What is the model? What do you think is going to happen? When do you think it's going to happen? And I said it literally changes by the week. Yeah. Even if you stay really informed, it's a real job. It's a full day job trying to stay on top of it. Yeah. So like Tom said, we're trying to come, we're trying to bundle forces here mm -hmm. and just see how the market is reacting, trying to see if, you know, what data is available to, to, to consolidate, to look at where's the movement starting? Can we see somebody, you know, bookings picking up? Can we see flights uh, starting to come in? You know, trying to see early signs for recovery because what is the re travel plans, uh, travel pa bans lifting, uh, flight routes going back to normal. But we also need to know that in places like Africa or in African destinations, we assume that the airlines are going to change the flight scheduling. And if there's no flights, there's no business. Yeah. Right. It's not, yeah. You're going to have a road trip down here. So for us, the airline industry is like one, we're watching the airline news. I have never known so many airline schedules as I know at the moment, because that <laughs> is like, I know every single plane. When a plane flies over, I can tell you which flight. Yeah. <laughs> it flies over. Yeah. So that's the kind of situation we have at the moment, because without the planes, we, you know, it's we're in a situation where this is the most in, this is so attached to our industry that at the moment we sort of we look at the rooms you know uh, what what Tom did mention is we're also looking at data cleanups while we wait for guests to come back we sort of you know advise our clients clean up your data make sure it's pretty this is a chance for you to do the spring cleaning of your life you know there's so much to do actually and we usually you know go through really old data but you can actually really do some great work now because we need to just wait for the market to recover we need for you know our our guests in the overseas markets to to be okay to be to to you know to get back on track you know everybody's fighting their battles yeah but what we can do at the moment is really tidy up um clean up our house you know up train skills yeah build new models and then and what we said what we can do as a team at the moment because we've got no numbers to crunch <laughs> we can we can sort of help the decisions makers and that's what we're working on um in creating a portal where there's like your stock market overview of all information that that goes into the decision making of is recovery here yes or no yeah yeah absolutely i think that would be really helpful to have that central source of trusted data and information just wanted to point out, so the nature of the business for the safari industry is also impacted. Um, there's, there, I guess there's an additional lag because just because people can fly doesn't mean they will, right? Because you have to market to these individuals, I guess, six or 12 months before they even make that decision. Like me with my baby elephant, just because flights are open doesn't mean I'm flying to Africa tomorrow, right? I, it's something that it's, it's a big yeah. Your right. government might not let you. You might not feel safe. There's a lot of campaigns which are understandable from the countries actually saying that, mm -hmm. you know, stay here. 
you know, don't take your your hard earned money somewhere else. You know, we also have people who have just, you know, been on lockdown who don't have the salaries that they, they used to have. There's a lot of factors that are going to play into it here. Yeah? So that's why it's so crucial to be able to tell the industry in Africa um, what is going to go on. And something that I also really want to mention at this point, the data that is available for Africa is just not there. Mm. All data models, all websites are based on a on a first world mo model. Yeah. So even the news is very trim. Yeah. So so we need to sort of deduct what is va- what is valid for our destination, because at the moment everybody is kind of a little high because it's like yeah, all these flights are going in to Europe, you know, and Europe's opening up, and I go like, excuse me, yeah. You you know this is European travel to each other that's opening yeah. up. Yeah, we just have to hold a moment and just wait till they're ready to travel to us. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, this, so we said that we wanted to have a platform that's Africa focused. Yeah, that sort of looks for the information for that's relevant for the African market. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Nicole, you touched on this already a few times on data quality, but <clears throat> maybe let's spend a minute talking about the importance of data quality and. How effective are the property management systems that are in place now in, in the, the hotels, the tourism, and you know the entire safari industry? Sure. Uh, Tom, do you want to grab that first, or? Um. So I well, no, I'll let you grab that first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's two things here. Um, if we uh, first of all, like we said, we have we have different levels of understanding. So first of all. We have a lot of properties that are small that don't have. So we, we're talking about small inventory. We're talking about bush camps. So that means like a tent, luxury tent, 20, mm-hmm. 20 keys. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, a lot of people in the past have actually never used software and uh, beyond an Excel or a spreadsheet um, to, 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 to log their bookings. Yeah. With the new technologies on the rise and people and softwares needing, needing to be able to talk to each other because we, you know, the push with the OTAs and 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 the online um, booking platforms um, is, is 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 a hard battle. So in order to to participate in the market, they have had to go digital. So now a lot of them bought digital uh, software. The software that is bought very often just doesn't work for our environment. We have power problems. We need everything to be cloud based, um, uh, multi property. Most camp no, most camp owners or most hotel owners don't own one, but they own several um, properties because it's usually a circuit. You usually travel along a circuit, so you would want one screen with all your hotels on it, and you want this to be somewhere in the cloud where everywhere your reservations office in the U.S. in South Africa in Vienna, everybody can grab the data. So. Mm-hmm. The problem is that the the reservation software, the big ones, are all based server-based and not cloud-based. So we've got some great solutions in Africa that are working, and those are also able to give us good data quality. Yeah. So so that's one thing. So we we've, we've had to homegrown our software, and one of our partners that we work with, ResRequest, does an amazing job. Um, but they you know that those those are the kind of uh, solutions that provide. What is really, really important, and that's a lot of what I do, is that we look at the data, and then we need to really work with the teams to get to a level that the data has. We work on uh, standard operating procedures, on on booking, um, you know, uh, forms, and trying to get people to really um, handle data on a daily level at all levels in the same way in order to create really um, good quality data moving forward. Um, so that's the input side of it. Yeah, so mm-hmm. that that I would say is my job and I try to get the users to use it correctly. And mm-hmm. then Tom takes over and he looks at it and he says like, have I done a good job in training and consulting the client? And then he will tell me, um, yeah, go, go, go back to square one or he will tell me like, good, Next problem solved. We move on. Tom, mm-hmm. did I? Yeah, I, no, no, perfectly. And and I think the one thing that's really surprised me, just um, with having chatted to a variety of different clients across um, the region, is you know a lot of them have opted for property management systems which are better suited to three hundred room hotels in Brussels or or hotel chains on 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 you know in the US on the East Coast or something like that. So. Um, you know, a lot of off-the-shelf off stuff. Um, th- there is 
you know, again, just mentioning Regicrest, who are a preferred partner. I mean, there is a lot of stuff that's built in Africa, um, you know, understanding the African sort of context, um, you know, in Africa, by Africa, for Africa. Um, and, and that's great. And they and they sort of understand it. So um, the other thing that I've really been surprised about um, is the analytical desert that's out there. There, you know, there, there are a lot of hotels in these different systems that, that are um, really doing all of their reporting and analytics in Excel. Um, you know, and the rest of the world has marched ahead with business intelligence, but the African tourism industry has been left behind. And I, and I think a lot of that's got to do with the um, the reservation systems that they've been on that, that have just been too clunky, mm. too too big, too slow, um, too dirty. Um, and in some cases, they can't even get the data out of those systems. So, um, but we are, you know, sort of working with ResRequest. Um, you know, there are um, there's business intelligence coming out of it. Um, there there is a there, there is a new trend, and we'd like to be. Um, right at the cutting edge of that um, to make sure that if you run a hotel that you've got a system that works that you can get data out of and you can make full use of all of the BI. Mm -hmm. Looks like we lost Nicole, but I'm sure she'll be back. It could be a Wi-Fi <coughs> issue. You mentioned that would happen. Um, while we wait for her to come back, we have a, a question here from Arvind. Oh, I see her. She's back. There you are. Oh, look, now you guys pop back. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we figured this would happen. We 52 minutes into the session, it had to happen once, right? <laughs> That's... Yeah. So, totally um, okay. <laughs> yes. There's a, a question here. What, uh, what's basically the peak tourism season for Africa? So that's actually a really good question. I, I think when Nicole is up there, um, it, it, it's much more seasonal than it is down in South Africa. Um, you know, South Africa, we've, you know, the the idea is that if you wanted to go on a safari, that you always had to come during the winter, because the winter it's beautiful and dry here. We, we get we get six months of blue skies and um, lazy sunrises and sunsets, and the grass is low, so you can see baby elephants and mongoose and all of these other little sort of creatures. And and there's no mosquitoes. There, there are very few insects, um, and and the nights are starry. So it was always thought that you should come, you know, to the South African bushveld during the winter. Um, it's traditionally when everybody went sort of hunting mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But um, as this industry sort of developed, and it, it's something I watched as as a guide, where we were we were quiet, you know, sort of um, November, January, February, March, um, and only really sort of busy during the winter season. Um, you know, by the time I left, we were busy all year round because um, there's also been a change. You know, people used to come to see all of the big animals. You just wanted to see. You know what they call Africa's big five, but um, as as the industry developed, uh, you know people come out to see birds and butterflies and and just to to picnic under trees and that that sort of stuff. So um, certainly certainly where I am, um, I, I I guess the the bulk of people would come during the European summer our, our winter out here because it's easier to watch wildlife. But um, mm. but I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a peak 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 season. Um, but it's much more seasonal when it is, I think. Because yeah. of monsoon yeah, we have, and yes, yes, we have. Uh, so, so first of all, it depends where you. You know, we obviously also cover beach. So at the moment, um, in in uh, in Zanzibar, for instance, or Kenya coast area, you would consider um, April and May is the rain season. So that means it's still got twenty eight to thirty degrees, but you know you'll get more rain um, than other days. And lots of properties just shut down for maintenance and. Uh, and and time to send the staff home yeah <laughs> unfortunately this year it was way more than we expected and way longer than we expected yeah um but uh yeah when it comes to the bush we have yeah i would i would say the standard holidays it sort of falls pretty much uh summer holidays and christmas holidays those are our peak seasons yeah although we shoulder seasons are starting to work uh, or used to work we'll see what happens after this yeah um situation but yeah i would say with the exception of something that we call green season because it's rainy yeah for mm -hmm. the more adventurous uh amongst uh clients who are ready to go out and uh and you know get muddy uh when it rains but there's a there's a there's a benefit there's you know every it, it's you can travel all year round but i would say the peak season would be the the, the school holidays or seasonal holidays in europe and in the u.s yeah Got it. Um, so I have a question. I kind of wanted to go back to that central newsfeed. I know we have about five minutes left, but I want to touch on that one more time because 
just wanted to get a sense of um, what is your approach or kind of where are you guys now in terms of trying to develop that central news feed for, for Africa and, and the impact on the industry? Sorting out bugs. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> I wasn't saying. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> yeah. So we've got um, we, we've got some we've got some good people working on it. I um, in terms of data sources, I have been begging and borrowing and pitching and stealing and doing anything I can across all of the major sort of aviation groups to to try and get their feeds. I I think where our conversation started was we wanted to run some um, clever sort of algorithms through the data just to work out when these airlines are going to we're going to start to open up but um as, as much as i try to pitch this as a pro bono project i mean they, they were talking tens of thousands of pounds um for monthly sort of feeds um but um i've whittled it down to um a, a few who are starting to hear me so we should have some good news there um and um and we've phoned a few friends to help with some news feeds Mm -hmm. um, but we have a team in Cape Town who are putting it all together. So I'm, I'm excited. It's just, um, I, I think, as Nicole says, and she's an amazing one for driving a project forward. Um, this should have been done about three weeks ago. Um, so, so tourism is very much a now thing. And um, a lot of these projects and the stuff that we're trying to do, I mean, we were just talking about how there's a, an amazing window now, um, as, as devastating as this crisis is, for people to clean up their systems and get involved in it. Um, you know, if we did that too much, then um, we're going to be busy again, and and there will have been lost time and lost opportunities to um, to push the reset button and to get some stuff done. So, um, so where are where are we? Um, we're um, we are, um, and they're making We've me laugh. We've got the parts together. We've got, <laughs> <laughs> We've got the parts. We're just sort of putting it all together. So the 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 parts on its own are are there. We're just sort of trying to get it all to work with each other. So. We'll, we'll we'll let you know and mm -hmm. and and we're happy to do a session all about data on when happy to come back and 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 show off what we have then hopefully yeah yeah but it's, it's a great, it's great it's, yeah it's a it's a great project and yeah if anybody's out there ready to share airline data please yeah call call Tom a good a good question to go to from <clears throat> Sudarshan saying tourism industry seems to be suffering now. Um, as we discussed, yep. And then are there any open data sources that are available to explore that you're aware of? I guess if, you, if you're if you aware of them, you're pulling them into your central news feed, right? Yeah, so so Nicole and, um, and, and one of her colleagues, Sarah, have put together a really um, amazing list of um, news, news sources and RSS feeds that we, we're trying to get. Um, in, in terms of um, data, um, there, there, there is a lot of data um, for tourism that's been published. Most of it's 2018, 2019, starting mm -hmm. to lag through. Um, any, any, anything that's current tends to be rather expensive. So, um, open sources, <laughs> not, not so much. Got it. Um, no, so until we you know, get we, we, as, as tourism as tourism is in in a real in a real downturn at the moment. I think that you know uh, we like Tom said you know. We were also hoping that there, there's some relief work out there for the data people just to open up the channels. We've seen so many other projects where, you know, everybody's putting their resources out there and just making them available for free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we were kind of hoping that that was also happen with the, with the, with the data content people, but so far, uh, at least for the, with the current data, it's, it's not there yet. And it would be really, it, it would make all the difference. Yeah. People, the industry does not have the money to spend on those feeds. Yeah, waiting for somebody to come in and buy that data at the moment in the current situation um, mm -hmm. is very unrealistic. Just in case somebody is waiting for that, yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. think I don't think anybody's going to be spending it on data. So, you know, uh, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Last question from the audience here from Kurt. Um, he's asking, what measures are <clears throat> what measures are taken to protect the stars of these great resorts, the animals themselves? Yes, the baby elephants. Um, how involved are the local governments and are they making the best use of modern technology such as drone surveillance systems to keep the tourists and animals safe? Mm -hmm. Who wants to answer that first? <laughs> big, 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 oh. big, big problem yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Kurt, yeah, and, and Kurt, that's a great question. Look, it's one of the um, one of the issues that the safari industry has grappled with for a long time is the, um, you know, 
not only the sustainability of what we do, but um, making sure that we do, we don't trample sort of ecosystems and stuff like that. Um, in, in terms of protecting the animals, I know that there's been a lot of um, really hard work over the last couple of years using um, some really um, ingenious types of surveillance equipment, um, boots on the ground and stuff like that to um, to try and reduce poaching, particularly, I'm sure you would have read about rhino poaching, which has been um, one of the real nasty sort of scourges of the you know, the problem down in Southern Africa recently. Um, and um, just where I am judging by the amount of helicopter activity and some of the pilot friends we have and the trips that they're doing, um, a, a lot of that anti-poaching work um, goes on. Um, probably uh, one, of, one of the thing is that a lot of these efforts are funded by the private sector, which in turn get a lot of their revenue from tourism. Um, so there's a, the, you know, we'll see where that sort of knockdown of effect is. Um, and given how many sort of jobs are in, in tourism, and you've got to remember that a lot of these wild places right through Africa um, are, you know, are surrounded by communities. Um, and those those communities and their livelihoods and their, and their jobs um, rely very much on, on on a on a vibrant, healthy tourism industry. So, um, when when you take that away and people start getting hungry, then you know the um, poaching, um, chopping down of sort of ecosystems for firewood and stuff like that. That that is that is an issue. Um, I, I, the governments definitely do take it seriously. Um, I, I know that. I, I think in Kenya, nearly one in every sort of ten people employed is in the tourism industry. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, and Tanzania is the same. Um, you know, some of these some of these countries are are, are resource poor, um, but but tourism rich. So, I, I think it's understood that wild wild systems need protecting. I think did I answer that? Yeah, I think I think the concern is really uh, because a lot of the conservancy, uh, a lot of the hotels that are in, in conservancies, uh, pay the, the 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 night you spend there pays to the conservancy and to the projects. So as there are no tourists coming in, there's of course a concern. That, um, that that money is going missing and it's no longer going to communities and community projects or uh, anti-poaching projects. So there is, uh, of course, a huge, huge concern that where all of this is going, yeah? Especially with uh, less cars in the parks and people being, you know, there's, um, I think the, the wildlife is, a, is a enjoying the, the cars time, um, but, uh, but uh, unfortunately um, also poachers will have more um, freedom. Yeah? So, so is, yes, uh, it's, 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 it's definitely it, something to watch out for. Yeah? It, it is worrying times, but it's also, um, you know, at the same time, just uh, we were, um, you know, certainly from everything I've, I've read that um, we, had been reasonably successful in the last couple of years in starting to really look after wild systems, um, you know, going green, um, sort of conservation, you know, getting rid of our carbon outputs. I mean, certainly when, you, when you're talking about stars and hotels, I mean, you, you want to see great examples of, of solar and places mm -hmm. where you go where there's absolutely no plastic. Come to some of the hotels in Africa. We, we um, benchmark the sort of sustainability efforts. I mean, there's a incredible no amount of hard and very yes, yes. Yeah, so I, I tell you what, we could show the world some stuff. We we we've got it together, and we're just just hoping that this um that this health crisis doesn't become a um a wildlife crisis too. And mm -hmm. and I think just to answer that, the the, the question on stars, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I certainly when I when I when I traveled around the world, you know, I always look at the first the price and then the number of stars and then the reviews. I think in that order. Um, I. I, I don't know, Nicole. It is, is is are stars and ratings a, a really big thing for African travel, or no? Oh, because the, no. the the star system is 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 basically you know based on other things than uh, uh, than we can provide. Because a a, a five star luxury tent may not uh, meet the requirements uh, of a, a Hilton in New York. Yeah, so I think that the rating system doesn't quite apply. Mm -hmm. um, luxury is just defined differently, so there's always been a discrepancy there. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I our our, rate, our rating systems upside down. We 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 rate our hotels on how many stars you can see through the roof. Yeah. <laughs> I think I love um, that. Stars meaning the the star of the show, not the star in terms of rating, but that was also good. 
<laughs> um, all right. So, Tom, Nicole, I know we're at time at this point. I, I just want to really thank you guys for jumping in and providing everything you know about this. Uh, the the um, safari industry it was really interesting to learn more about the space. And, you know, thank you for the LinkedIn and YouTube live audience for joining and, you know, asking some great questions and putting out some good comments. I saw a couple there that said, let's go see the baby elephants. So I'm ready for it. I'm <laughs> yes, we are ready. Kari <laughs> Yes, and yes, I need to end with, you know, you guys are doing some really great work and where can people go to ask you questions or learn more about the company that you're working with? Tom? Cool, uh, so um, are we able to share my um, email address? Um, yeah, <clears throat> sure. There? Yeah. So I think it's on there. Otherwise, um, you can you can find me at pomeralpartners.com, um, which is great. And I'd I'd be delighted to to answer any questions and give anybody um, any sort of insights. Um, yes, yeah. so please. Okay. Yeah. Same here, Nicole. Nicole at step one um, uh, dash tz dot com. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we're both. We're both. Any bookings? I, I'm happy to 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 pass on bookings for Tanzania. <coughs> yeah, Harry Busana. Perfect. No, well, come see the elephants. Come see the elephants in Africa. South yeah. Africa. Yes. We got more baby <laughs> elephants. East Africa. <laughs> and Africa raids by the stars. See you there. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, thank you so much again for joining, and um, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank, thank you. you very thank much, you so Kate. much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye.